grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So I'm going to break this up into three parts. I'm going to start with Acts chapter 1 and Ascension. Uh, Ascension was on Thursday, 40 days after Easter, you know, based on Luke's words. Uh, you know, for 40 days, he gave them many, you know, convincing proofs uh, in chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, so let me, let me start there in 1, verse 3. Uh, to them, to the 12 apostles, 11 apostles, Jesus presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And, and the historicity, the actual history of Christianity is really important for Christianity, uh, you know, because, you know, we have this promise that, you know, if you become a Christian, your life will become as comfortable and easy and joyous as it was for the Apostle Paul, as seen in Acts. You know, uh, that's the comfort we have. You know, if Christianity were, you know, kind of a salve to our wounds, uh, you know, kind of comfort in the midst of a dark and dreary world, and it's just a pleasant idea and a pleasant thought, uh, you know, Christianity would basically be, how shall I say, wrong unless it is actual history, which then leads us, I think, to the ascension and the importance of the role of the ascension. Uh, so I, I think 1 verse 6, Acts 1 verse 6 is so funny. Uh, when they had come together, the 12, the apostles, asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I, I know what you've been told, you know, that that the Jews, all they wanted was an earthly kingdom, and this is one of my pet peeves. Uh, so the basic expectation, you know, there were a lot of ex expectations about, you know, the messianic kingdom and all that kind of stuff. So if you will bear with me, if you'll bear with me, uh, the basic thought for most Jews, and it's hard to paint this just in broad strokes, but I'm going to do that. It's a little unfair, but the basic expectation was the pagan rulers, you know, the, the evil rulers of this world, God would come and establish his kingdom, and there would be two parts to it. One is that God's people would rule under God. You know, God says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And God's people say, you will be our God, and we will be your people. So that's one aspect of it, just God living with his people and ruling over his people. That's key, because the God's people were not being ruled by God at that point. They were being tyrannized by other nations. And that's the other part of it is number one, God rules. And number two, uh, the evil empires, all the enemies of God would be defeated and overthrown. And both those aspects are what we believe and teach and confess historically, that both of those things happen the false expectation, as far as I'm concerned, the false expectation of the Jews and of the apostles here is they thought that would all happen at once. God would establish his reign and rule over his people, and God would eliminate his enemies. And so I just want you to track with me here and see how he answers those two aspects of it, because uh, it's not exactly clear, but I think I'm right in interpreting this, but go ahead and you know, give your comments below or to me face to face. Okay, so will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, establish your kingdom, number one, and number two, uh, eliminate your enemies, okay? It's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Answering the question, when will God eliminate his enemies. Okay? Are you with me? Because that's the part that they're, they're looking around going, you know, Rome is still in charge. The godless pagan people are still in charge. Uh, when are you going to do that? Uh, God will take care of that in his own time. So reference to the not yet aspects of establishing God's kingdom. God will eliminate his enemies on the last day when he decides to do so. Hopefully now. But apparently not. 1 verse 8, 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's the answer to part one of the Jewish expectation and our expectation, God establishing his rule and his reign, but he's doing it kind of behind enemy lines. You know, God lands behind enemy lines and then just kind of slowly through, you know, subterfuge through, you know, things like word and sacrament ministry, he establishes his rule and his reign here on earth through the witness of his apostles. And regarding the historicity of this, Matthew, uh, Matthew, Acts 21 and 22, I think this is vitally important, again, to the historical basis of our faith. So one of the men, uh, this is uh, Peter replacing Judas, and it's the qualifications for an apostle that I, I think is really important. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, that I think is a reference to Jesus's baptism, until the day he was taken up from us, that's the ascension, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. That is to say, the books of the New Testament are written by people who witnessed Jesus's entire ministry from his baptism all the way to his ascension. These were eyewitnesses. And so the New Testament was either written by eyewitnesses or by people who, like Luke, went to the eyewitnesses and talked to them, okay? Uh, Mark apparently, supposedly, we're told by church history that he got his information from Peter. Uh, Matthew and John, of course, church history tells us that these were actual apostles of Jesus, and that's the important, the important part. Uh, then the letters of Peter, the letters of John, of course, again, eyewitnesses, the only exceptions to this in the New Testament are, of course, the 13 letters of Paul, uh, who got his information. I'm going to jump to this. Uh, 26 verse 16, Jesus says to Paul in his conversion, uh, I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, that's a vision, and to those in which I will appear to you, that's a vision. Uh, and so Paul got special training from Jesus, as well as being immersed in the teachings of the law and the prophets. Uh, we also have the examples of James, who was the brother of Jesus, not an apostle, and Jude, who was a brother of Jesus and not an apostle. Uh, you know, how much were they aware of Jesus's entire ministry? Did they go following him around? Don't know. Uh, but just, I think this is important as far as why do we trust the New Testament? And if the answer is, it's eyewitness apostolic testimony. I, now, uh, let me go back to the ascension. You know, uh, Sunday, Sunday we're... Uh, you know, you're supposed to celebrate the Ascension, you know, on the day of the Ascension, you know, the Thursday before the seventh Sunday of Easter. Uh, I don't do that. One worship service is enough for me. Uh, but I was thinking about, you know, why, why, why am I calling Ascension Sunday a high festival? And I thought about it, and I was like, hey, I'm going to wear my robe, you know, I'm going to make it special. Uh, that's the only way I'm making it special. And just highlighting the fact, this is the ascension of Jesus. But why is it a high festival? And I started thinking, oh, well, it's in the creed. It's in the creed. Uh, you know, and thinking about the creed, it's like, what do we celebrate? Well, Christmas. He was born of the Virgin Mary. Uh, you know, we, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And we celebrate his death, and we celebrate his resurrection, and we even celebrate the final, the final return of Jesus on the last day, on the last day of the church year. And then I was thinking, oh, okay, so we celebrate Ascension as a high festival. We celebrate Pentecost as a high festival because I believe in the Holy Spirit. 
but we we don't celebrate really the Annunciation, at least I never have, and maybe we should. And I'm sure you can figure out when the Annunciation is, because that whole, you know, nine month thing. Right. And so uh, that's kind of how we organize our church year. All right. One final comment. Uh, if you've heard this before, the analogy of the now and not yet with Midway. I'm going to give that to you now. So you, you can skip over it if you've heard it before. Uh, this is nothing new to me. But maybe you'll find this interesting if you have not heard it. So Jesus comes at his first appearance 2,000 years ago. He, he comes at his first appearance and he inaugurates his reign. He wins the victory. The war is, in effect, over when Jesus dies on the cross as proven by his resurrection. That's the, that's the initiation of his reign, the inauguration of his reign, uh, the, you know, the first planting of the seed of his reign. It's there, but there's all this opposition to Jesus going on for the next 2,000 or so years. And then the final victory, the full establishment without opposition of his kingdom happens on the last day. So this is analogous to uh, World War II, uh, the United States entered war with Japan on December 8, 1941. By, I'm pretty sure it's August of 1942, the war was over. The victory was won at the Battle of Midway. So I am told that it was such a decisive victory that Japan just was sent reeling. Uh, the, the war was over. In effect, it was just a mop-up operation from 1942 until September of 1945 when you had the final surrender of Japan. Pardon me if my, any of my dates are wrong or any of my facts are wrong, uh, but you get the general gist of the idea. Now, mind you, that what I call the mop-up operations from uh, 1942 to 1945 involved an awful lot of war and pain and suffering and death. And that's kind of what we're going through right now. The victory is assured by Jesus's death on the cross, but the final capitulation of the enemy, the final surrender of the enemy or the removal of the enemy will not happen until the last day. And in the meantime, we will have as much comfort and as much peace and prosperity as the apostle Paul had. Because that is the way of the cross, right? All right, God's peace be with you, amen.